Um, so first of all, thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming along. Um, do you want to go back one? Just, just in case you don't know analysis, Mason, we're a, a research and consulting company. We're focused on telecoms. So most of my examples that I'll talk about are, are what telecoms operators are doing. Um, but at the end, I think there's time for questions and we can broaden it out and, and talk m more widely about what other companies are doing. Uh, I want to talk firstly about where we are with IoT, but in, in, in terms of the numbers, and then I'll get into looking at some of the barriers, some of the barriers to, to IoT, specifically looking at IoT compared to cloud. So IoT was maybe the hype topic of a couple of years ago. Five years ago, it was probably cloud. Now cloud is now taking off. IoT has some challenges. So I'll look at the comparison between IoT and cloud, and then I'll give some examples of what different companies are doing to, to overcome those challenges. First of all, though, let's just start with the numbers. So as part of our research, we're tracking about 20, 25 companies that report IoT, IoT revenues. In itself, it's quite interesting that only 20, 25 companies report IoT. Um, typically, companies report um, on something that's big. Um, the fact that only a small number of companies is reporting it sort of tells you something straight away. But the companies that are, here's three of them. So PTC, you probably don't know, it's a, a US software company. It has an IoT division called ThingWorks, which is an application platform, which makes it easier for developers to, to create IoT services. So that's PTC. Now, of the companies we track, PTC is the one that's growing quickest, 29% year-on-year growth from the beginning of, uh, for the first half of 2018. So pretty reasonable rate of growth. Intel needs no introduction, 19% uh, of growth, again, a reasonable rate of growth. Um, and then in terms of telecoms operators, a few four or five report revenues, Vodafone 12%, and that's typical of the, the telecoms operator rate of growth. So on its own, those numbers look, look pretty good. Any, any business that was growing a division by more than 10% will be fairly, fairly happy with that growth. Then if we go to the next slide and, and look at it in terms of revenues, well, PTC, a bit, bit smaller. But for Intel, first half of this year, they made $1.7 billion worth of, of revenue from IoT, so it's a reasonable number. Vodafone, a bit less than, than half a billion in a year, so it's growing quite quickly, so probably in the next 12 months, it'll generate more than a billion dollars of revenue from IoT. So we've seen it's, it's IoT, it's, quite, it's growing quite quickly, and the numbers are all right, quite, quite high for revenue. But let's put that into some, some context. So if you go to the next slide, Start with Intel. So that's Intel's IoT revenue. That's the rest of Intel's revenue, just, just for the six months. That's that tiny slide there. That's Vodafone's IoT revenue, and that's the re rest of I rest of their revenue. So for Intel, it's what about five percent of revenues coming from IoT. For Vodafone, it's less than two percent of revenues. A bit higher for PTC. So ten percent or so, a bit more than than their revenues. So when you put it into the context of the rest of their business, IoT is still very small. Growing quickly, faster than the rest of the business, but still very, very small. If we go then to the next slide and compare it to cloud. As I said, I was going to do some comparisons through this, this presentation with what's happening in, in, in cloud. A number of them report their revenues, the revenue growth. Obviously, AWS is, is the biggest. So Azure, Alibaba, Google uh, uh, as well, of them, AWS is the biggest. It's the biggest, but it's also the slowest growing, but it's still growing at basically 50% year on year. So it's, it's growing much quicker. Put some context around the, the, the speed of growth of IoT. Cloud is growing much quicker than IoT. And in terms of revenue overall, if you go to the next slide, Pat, AWS for the first half of the year made about $12 billion, $12 billion of revenue. The three companies that I gets, gets to about Two billion, just over over two billion. Even if you add all the companies that we track it, um, that are reporting IoT revenues, you get to about three billion, three and a half billion, something like that. So a long a, a long way short of what AWS is going. Put that in some sort of context. Vodafone's annual IoT revenue is worth about two weeks of AWS's revenue. So lots of hype about IoT. But still, when you look at it right now, it's still, it's still pretty small. <coughs> Go to the next slide. Last year, we did a, a survey of enterprises, and we asked them whether they were adopting IoT, whether they had any, any operational IoT solutions in, in place. So give us the, the range of answers here. So 
20% of US companies claimed they were doing something operational IoT, much lower in Germany, just 10%. I'm not sure why it's so low in Germany. I'm quite surprised that it's so low in Germany. Um, but on average, we're talking about sort of 15% of enterprises. If you then split that up between large enterprises and small enterprises, for large enterprises, the number's higher. It's maybe 30% in that, in that sort of range have some sort of IoT project. For small enterprises, it's about 10, 11%. So only one in 10 small companies has any, any sort of IoT project. Probably more interesting, though, is the next slide. This is the percentage of companies that either don't know what IoT is, or they know what it is and they're not interested. So again, quite varied results. You can take them all with a bit of a pinch of salt. It's just a survey. It's probably not exactly right, but it's, it's, it's a good indicator, I think. So in France, two thirds of companies either don't know what IoT is or have no interest in it. On average, across our survey, it was about it was about 50 percent. So this kind of goes against the assumption. The assumption that we have when we're forecasting IoT is that pretty much every vertical sector will implement IoT in one form or another. This is telling us that that's probably not the case, at least not right now. And again, if you if you look at just at SMEs, you look at small businesses, the number is much higher. So it's more like 60, 70 percent of small businesses either don't know what it is or have no interest in it. Now, at first, that's, that's maybe surprising, but for, for most businesses, when you say IoT, um, they don't know what it is, it doesn't mean anything to them. And not surprising, they've got other things to worry about than, than, than this technology acronym. If we go to the next slide, what I wanted to do here is just compare what's happened with cloud. So cloud, we saw from the AWS numbers, it's, it's growing quickly, 50% a year. It's big in terms of revenue, 12 billion just for AWS, never mind Azure and Google and so on. So what is cloud doing well that IoT isn't doing yet? So there's a bunch of things. This, is probably, this isn't exhaustive. There are other reasons you can think of. I'll go through them. Firstly, awareness is high for cloud. Lots of companies are aware of cloud, one form or another, even if it's just using um, some sort of cloud software, there's, there's an awareness there. For IoT, as we saw from the previous slide, Awareness is, is limited, and even where the companies are aware of it, they're not necessarily interested. So that 50% figure of companies not interested or, or not aware. So awareness is still pretty low for, for IoT. Cloud, it has global reach. You have one data, data center, one cloud infrastructure. You can provide service around the world. IoT, pretty much by definition, is local. You need a piece of hardware. It involves hardware, and you need to install that hardware. You need to fit that hardware. That's almost, as I say, by definition, that involves somebody locally. You can't just do it one instance in, in, in a data center in Dublin and, and provide the world. You need something local. That's another, another barrier. The third point is around supply, concentrated supply. If you think of the cloud services, you've got, as I say, AWS, you've got Azure, you've got Google, you've got a, a few others, but really a, a fairly small number of companies really pushing, really pushing cloud. Whether as for IoT, it's very fragmented. You've got hardware companies, you've got software companies, you've got telecoms operators, you've got systems integrators, all of which are pushing, vying for a position within the IoT market. There are thousands of these different companies. We haven't really seen a shakeout. We don't have one company pushing IoT. We have all of this, 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 these different companies competing for, for a position on the value chain. So that causes, I think that's a barrier. In terms of the business case, the transition from a traditional uh, maybe on-premise or co-location site to, to using cloud, there's a very clear business case. Even if all you're doing is taking a simple application and, and, and lifting and shifting it, the savings are, are maybe 30% year on year. So very simple, uh, uh, very clear business case. For IoT, it's much less certain, much harder to see what the, uh, what the business case is. Um, so as one, one example, I just bought, I've just moved house, I've just bought a new, a new washing machine and it's a, it's a connected washing machine, it's got Wi-Fi connection. Now, all of the washing machines I was looking at had, had Wi-Fi connection, I think at that, that, the, the, the price point I was looking at, it's basically become the standard. But from, from LG's perspective, it's not that clear what the benefit of having it connected is. For me, it's not that clear for having it connected, let's be honest. Um, 
I can turn the washing machine on remotely as long as I've put all the washing in, closed the door, put the washing powder in. But, yeah, so that's not much use. Um, it tells me that the washing is done. I get a notification on my app that the, wa the washing is finished. Again, it's nice to know, but if I'm not at home, I can't really do much about it. Now, possibly there's benefit for LG because finally they know exactly how the washing machine is being used and they can see how the spin cycle, whatever, and, and how it performs after a year or after two years, probably information they didn't have before. Um, so maybe there's a benefit for LG, but even for LG, there's a cost for them of, of making it, adding the Wi-Fi, adding, connecting, supporting the apps and so on. Um, in, a, in a business, the white goods business, where margins are very tight, so there's a cost for them. Maybe there's a benefit further down the line, but it's not clear. Um, also, I was talking to a, a car company recently, and they're looking at connecting their cars. They haven't done it yet. Now, one of the benefits they were saying is that they can actually see how the gearbox is used in the, in the real life. Because they don't know how people are using it, how much time they spend in third gear. Do they rev it? Do they change gear? They don't, all this information they don't know, so they will be able to find out. But for them, there's the cost of connecting the car. And so... Possibly there's a benefit that they could make better gearboxes or they could, if they're over-engineering them or they could change the gear ratio, possibly there's a benefit. But again, the car industry, very, very thin margins and it's not clear exactly what the business case is for, for connecting. That's a, a really big challenge, I think, for lots of these IoT solutions. Some of them have a clear business, co business case, but most of them it's, 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 it's not clear. Just in terms of processes, the shift to cloud is relatively straightforward, relatively seamless for lots of people in the business. It may be you're taking one application, putting it in a different environment, it doesn't affect too many people. If you're talking about IoT, where you have hardware, you have um, the different elements of it, that's complicated. But also in terms, of, in terms of the process itself. So quite often IoT is about automating an existing process. And that may have implications on labor force. It may be you wanna lay off people, you wanna have fewer, fewer resources. Now, clearly, for any organization, that's, that's very difficult to do. That's going to take a long time. So if you think of something like a smart metering rollout, um, for, for that, it's got many components. Kind of jump onto the components point. Cloud, very few components. IoT has many components. You think of smart meters. You obviously have the, the meter itself. You need somebody to then install the meter. You need to connect the meter. You have the application that the meter runs on. So you've got all of the complexity of those different components. Um, and you need to arrange, obviously, for somebody to come and change your meter and all of that. Um, and the long-term idea is that by doing that, you'll get rid of the workforce that went around to look at, to, to, to read those meters and either redeploy them or, or lay them off. That's a big, complicated, long-term process. It's not like shifting an application from one environment to another. It's about having an impact on processes through all of these, the, these, these components. So, all of which makes it very difficult. Again, it's going to lengthen the, lengthen the whole time, lengthen the whole process. Cloud often has a clear, clear trigger. So, for a company that's uh, leasing space in a, leasing co-location space in a data center, there's a lease. And when that lease ends, then it's a trigger to look at what else they could do. And often that's the cause for them to, to, to look at moving to a, a public cloud environment ra rather than sticking with co-location. So, there's a, there's a trigger for IoT, that trigger doesn't typically exist. So for the car company, they can choose whether they put connectivity in or not. If they think the business case makes sense, if they think they can improve their gearbox, maybe it makes sense, but they're not forced to. The same for the, the washing machine um, company. There's no real trigger. There are some examples of triggers, typically from regulation, so regulation around smart metering, around e-call for, for cars. So there are some examples of where we see it, a trigger, but typically that's not the case. Doesn't, it rarely has a trigger. The final point here is around standard contracts. So with AWS, there is a, a public price list. There is a set of terms that AWS has. You take them or you leave them. There's no negotiation. You, you go to the website and you buy them. IoT doesn't work like that, mostly, not yet. You, are, you enter long negotiations. It's a complicated process. It could be an RFI process. It takes months and months. There isn't a standard contract, so everything is bespoke. And that, again, adds, adds complexity, adds time. I guess the, the other point to add with all of this um, it, it, is that for any of these things, when it, whether it's, let's take the, the washing machine example, you know, how often do you replace your washing machine? 
maybe once every, every 10 years, there's quite a long replacement cycle. It's the same if you're talking about manufacturing, industrial, how often do the, are, are machines change within a manufacturing environment? Again, once every 10 years, once every 20 years. Some of them can be retrofitted, some of them can't. Again, with a car, how often do you change your car? Maybe every five years. So there's a natural cycle, and it's quite a long cycle for a lot of these things. And that, again, it pushes it out. Takes, all of this is gonna, it's gonna take a long time. Now, I want to give a few examples of what different companies are doing, what different telecoms companies are doing to, to get rid of some of these barriers, to make it easier, to speed, to accelerate the adoption. So if we go to the, the first, oh, just to, yeah, before I get there, clearly for companies involved in IoT, they want to think about how can you get rid of these barriers. So I talked about low awareness, particularly amongst SMEs, and that's really, it's down to suppliers to do that. It's down to suppliers to promote, promote IoT. If you're a company and you're using IoT and it's giving you a competitive advantage, you're not going to tell anybody about it because that's a competitive advantage. It's up to the suppliers to do that, to do that promoting. Let's go to the next one. Kind of related to the same point around, around the business case. So AWS, um, Amazon, as part of its, um, the help that it gives companies, it has support for developers, whether they're documentation or videos and so on, but it also has an economics team, so it can, so it can um, if you're thinking of moving to cloud, it can help you understand what the business case would be for doing, doing so. It doesn't really exist for, for IoT. There are no companies putting together those economic models in the way that a AWS does. So there's work to be done there. And potentially that could involve different models. We'll talk about some different models in a minute. Big point around complexity. Right now, if you want to build an IoT solution, you, you either go to a systems integrator, and the systems integrator will deal with the hardware and the application and the connectivity, so essentially you're, you're, you're outsourcing all of that complexity, or you do it yourself, and you pull together all of those pieces. Now, very few companies have the, have the capabilities, have the skills to pull those pieces together. It's all, again, it's bespoke. Standards are, are coming, but early stage. So it's very difficult to pull those pieces together, most companies don't have those skills. Or, you, yes, you can go to a systems integrator, which is fine if you're a big enough company. It's a project that has a clear business case. But if you're a small company, that's not an option. So complexity needs to be reduced. And then, yeah, go to the next one. It needs to be made easier to buy. It can't just be all done through bespoke contracts. The idea of IoT reaching billions of connections, even millions of connections, can't be done if each time you need a bespoke contract and you need to go negotiate that contract. It needs to be done under, under standard terms, much easier, just as we've seen with, um, with AWS. <coughs> okay, we, so now I'll go through a few examples of what companies, are, what companies are doing. So if you go to the next slide. So this is about IoT connectivity. So I'm thinking really about cellular connectivity, the area that Pat and I have obviously worked in. Now, the traditional model is around this consultative model, consultative sale of connectivity. So we worked for a company last year that was buying um, IoT connectivity, cellular connectivity. It was reasonably complicated in that they wanted global connectivity, so they wanted connectivity in lots of different countries, and it was relatively high bandwidth. But actually what they were buying was fairly simple. It, it was just a, a, a bunch of sims to do high bandwidth. The process that we went through, so we helped them out with the, with, the, with the RFI. So we wrote the RFI, which was about 20 pages long. We got the responses from the different operators. The responses were about 100 pages long. The whole process took about three months from start to finish, from start of the process to, to actually getting all the, all the um, responses back. And in the end, the project didn't happen. So that's kind of where we are, with, and that's very typical of a consultative sale of connectivity. Maybe it makes sense for very complicated, very large contracts, but in most cases, that's just an extra expense that, that most companies just can't afford. Second model is, is, is really the same, but you may be adding bits of hardware um, applications with it. So Telefonica has a deal with um, Nestle for the uh, Nespresso machines, the commercial Nespresso machines, they're connected. So Telefonica, in that case, it's selling connectivity. It's also providing the connectivity module, the bit, the bit of hardware that goes in, into those devices. And so I think it's also providing some, some security around it as well. So there's this sale of connectivity and other services. But again, it's a traditional model, it's RFP, it's quite long, complicated, and so on. What we're seeing emerge now is a more transactional sale of connectivity. So a couple of companies doing that, if you go to the next slide, is, is Twilio. And once, so Twilio, has anybody heard of Twilio? Do you know who Twilio is? 
you've probably used Twilio even though you don't know it. So if you've used WhatsApp, if you've used Uber, when you first use them, you get an SMS to um, confirm your, your mobile number. That is sent via Twilio. So Twilio has agreements with all of the mobile operators. They've got 600, 700 agreements with mobile operators around the world um, to send those, those text messages. So it acts as an aggregator, and it has those deals with the, the 700 or so mobile operators around the world. So you don't know you've used it, but you've used it. Now, they want to take the same model that they've got for SMS, also for voice services, and use it for IoT. So if you want global connectivity, you would just go to, to Twilio, and they would sort it out. They, would, they could give you connectivity, whether you, whether you want it in Brazil or in Ireland or in the US. That's a, a single model for doing that. So if you go to the next slide. So this is the, their thing called, called programmable wireless. So it's a single co company that, as I say, gives you, gives you global connectivity. But it also, it, it's really trying to follow the AWS model. So in terms of pricing, you can go onto their website and you can see their pricing. Whether you want, their, whether you want to know the price for Saudi Arabia or South Africa or Argentina, it will give you the price per megabyte. And it's a competitive price. It's maybe not the cheapest you can get, but it's a competitive price. And it's all transparent there on their website. If you want to know which carriers they're using, it'll tell you which mobile operator they, they're working with in, in Argentina or wherever it is. They'll tell you if the connectivity is 2G or 3G or 4G. So they're very transparent, lots of doc documentation, very easy to use. It's all via API. Now that compares to the project we did last year. One of the suppliers, we asked it three times who the mobile operators it was working with, and they finally told us. And it also took us three attempts to find out whether it was where they had 2G and 3G and 4G. They weren't transparent at all, mostly because they didn't have 4G connectivity in lots of the countries we were, we were interested in. But it was this, this process. This is why it took three months in the traditional model. Twilio, you just go onto their website. You can see their pricing. You can see their connection. You can see their deals. So it, it, it's very easy. It's very simple. As I say, it all runs from, from APIs. No need to talk to anybody. No, no manual processing involved. And that's really what I think we need to get to if we're going to get to these, these millions or tens of hundreds of millions of connections. It can't have a manual process behind each time. It's just going to be too complicated, too costly. Particularly when we're talking about narrowband IoT, so when we're talking about connecting things where the revenue per connection is very low, e even more so. Any, any sort of manual intervention adds cost and, and makes it um, unfeasible. So that's, um, that's Twilio. That's an example of one of their, their customers, Dwello. So that's a... Um, if you rent out your house through Airbnb and you want to have um, uh, a smart door lock, so the, your, your tenant has like a one-time access code, um, so other things like that. They, they're using, using Twilio. They're not actually trying to be global. They're just trying to do it in one country. It just makes it easier for them to do so. So that's, that's Twilio's model. If you go to the next slide, this is another company, a European company, so based in Germany called, called Once. I, I talked about IoT needing different business models. So they are selling IoT on a single flat fee. So it's 10 euros, one-off cost. That includes the cost of the SIM. It includes 10 years of connectivity. <coughs> It includes 500 megabytes of connection uh, of, of, of data and 250 SMS. So, very simple, single single price for, for everything. If you want more data, you buy another 500 megabytes for another 10 euros. So again, very disruptive, very different model from the way that telecoms operators are, are used to working. But if you're an IoT company and you just want a simple cost certainty. Um, this works across 28 different countries, uh, across the EU countries, so very simple, very easy model to use. So again, very disruptive from the traditional way of, of, of operating. So if we think about the barriers, to the, go to the next slide, sorry. So obviously these don't resolve all of the problems, they resolve some of them. So in terms of local, I said before that the, the good thing about AWS, you do it once, it gives you global um, whether as most of IoT solutions you have local. Now, clearly, this is just talking about connectivity, but at least with Twilio, you use that one API and you can, you can get global connectivity. With Once, it gives you connectivity across 28 countries. So it's not solving all the problems, but it's making it easier. The big thing that they're focusing on is the contracts. It just makes contracting much easier, much easier to use. It gets rid of some of the complexity. So it's only one part of the value chain, but it's a really nice example of, of what some operators are doing. If go to the next slide, Pat. So this is KPN, so the Dutch incumbent operator, KPN. 
it's doing sort of two aspects that I think are interesting. One is it's got a, a menu of different options and of different bits and pieces that you might need in the value chain. So if you need some hardware, they've got some of their own hardware. They've also got some um, uh, preferred partners. So if you want temperature sensors or, or humidity sensors, they've got partners that they've worked with before and that they can, they can recommend. As you'd expect, the telecoms operator, they've got a bunch of different connectivity options, including some like LoRa and LTM specifically for, for IoT. They also have something on the, the application element, so they have an application enablement platform, so it makes it easier for developers to build, build services. They have four plug and play solutions, so including the, all of the software. Um, they have security, they have a data services hub, they have their own hosting and storage, so if you didn't want to use an AWS but you wanted storage, maybe you wanted to keep it in the Netherlands, they've got an option there and they've got professional services. So they've got all of these, these, these this module of options, the menu of options that they can sell you um, and they've used them themselves, they've worked so they can tell you um, hardware that will work on LoRa that, that will be stored in their data centers and secure and you know they've used it before it, it, it's going to work. It may not be the cheapest solution but it's, it, it's packaged and it, uh, it gives you that, that security. So all of that I think is quite interesting. The other thing that they're doing is a, um, they, they sponsor something called the um, IoT Academy. So this is based in, in Rotterdam, they have a space in Rotterdam and they have frequent events, so it might be somebody talking about uh, doing a presentation on um, messaging protocols or on security for IoT. So it gets developers along, and that ranges from, I think they've had Shell there, so big, massive multinationals coming along, to, to small startups that want to understand a bit more about IoT, how it works. So they're giving some of that developer support, um, and on the back of that, they can do a sort of soft sell on, on some of these components. It's not really to push these components, it's just to say, if you want to build such and such a di uh, such and such a application, we've got some hardware that could help. And have you thought about this? And we could sell you the, the hosting. So it's quite a neat solution in that they're they're trying to make it easier for developers, both through the developer training and through the the options that they've got. So again, if you go to the next slide, Pat, it doesn't do everything that it needs to be doing. It, it's obviously working on trying to re reduce um, the lack of awareness. Um, it will help out on the, the business case. So one of the things this, this IoT Academy is doing um, is helping develop pilots, both technically but also some support on the, uh, the business case. Um, many components. So it's not providing the whole solution. It's not doing everything. It's not building the application for them, for, for, for the developers. But it is at least reducing some of the complexity and some of the uncertainty because they'll sell you hardware for LoRa that works in their hosting environment and so on. They'll try and make it a bit simpler for you. So again, it's getting rid of some of this complexity. So that's KPN. Um, then the next one, I think this is a really interesting example. Um, I presented this a few times and I've been told this isn't really IoT, um, which is probably true, but I don't think it really matters. Because if you're, it's for the retail market. Now, a retail market is not going to come to you and say, I want an IoT solution. They're going to say they want a smart retail solution or they want to, well, they want to sell more stuff, really. And, and, and Telefonica is doing a lot to help them. So two, two examples of what they're doing here. So this is the, um, one of their customers is Do Free. So this is a big chain of, of duty free stores. This is the one in, in, in Madrid. Um, you'll see the, the screens going around the top there, that wavy blue screen. That's provided by Telefonica. So that's one example of what they're doing at, at the sort of high end of the market, quite bespoke, quite expensive for, for big retailers. They also have this solution here, which is a box. You can buy it, you can order it on their, on their website. They send it to you, you plug it into the back of your router and it will do things like guest Wi-Fi, it'll do music, it'll also do digital signage in a, in a store. So if you had a, a small chain of, let's say, pharmacies, if you had three or four pharmacies and you wanted to have a, a display signage in each of those pharmacies showing the same information, you could manage it through this, through this box. Now what's interesting about, if you go to the next slide, Pat, What's interesting about what Telefonica is doing is that they're trying to provide all aspects of the solution. So they provide the hardware. The screens, the wavy screens that I showed you there, that was all provided and, and um, uh, developed by, by Telefonica. They provide connectivity, the connectivity you would expect from them. So uh, if it's a, a broadband connection or a, a mobile connection, but also things like Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth beacons or other local area connections. So provide connectivity. They provide the platform. So it means that Dufree, they, from their head office, they can manage what's going on, what's being displayed in all of the signs across their duty-free stores around the world. Or if you're that chain of four pharmacies, you can manage what's being shown in the screens there. They've got an analytics element. 
So it can do things like um, measure the footfall through a store. Uh, it's connected to the EPOS terminals so they can see the, the, the sales and how that's related. So one of the things they've done in the duty-free stores, um, because obviously it's in airports and people are coming into the airports at different times. You think of an airport like Dubai, which is a, people are, the time zone is going to be different depending on which flight you're coming off. So they change the, the mood lighting dependent on the time of the person who's arriving. So it might be blue or yellow or whatever. Um, and, and then they've correlated that with the sales through the analytics. So they can see what color mood lighting you need in the store to sell more um, just by changing the display. So they can do sort of fun stuff like that by, by, by playing around with the combination of managing the hardware and doing the analytics and so on. Other thing that I think is interesting about Telefonica, so the services that they offer, obviously around the, uh, the, the, the basic stuff of, of the screens, but also they have a, a graphics department. So G3, it's a big multinational company. Um, they obviously have their own graphics department, but the sort of screens that Telefonica is selling them are different shapes and different sizes from what they're used to. So Telefonica will take the basic graphics and adapt them to fit on the screens going, going round for, for G3. They also have musicologists on staff. So they have people, all the piped music that you hear when you're in a store, um, that's being programmed by people who work for Telefonica. So there's somebody who works full-time at Telefonica just on the duty-free account, just managing the music that's played in duty-free stores around the world. The other thing is around installation. So they will manage the installation of these screens. So they don't do it themselves. They have local subcontractors who go and actually, the guy, the guy told me it's, it's a screwdriver business. They go and actually install the screens. So it's not just something being managed remotely. So they're doing some of that, that local work as well. Now, if you look at it in terms of the numbers, I think it's the next slide. So it, it's in about 100 countries. They've got 7,500 SME customers. That, the box I showed you before for the simple guest Wi-Fi, that sort of thing. 1,000 enterprise customers. It's making 50 million euros. Now, for Telefonica, 50 million euros, it's not a huge business, but it's a, it is a real business. It's probably bigger than most telecoms operators, uh, telecom operators' entire IoT business. So it's, it's to a reasonable scale. Um, both in terms of revenues and in terms of people, it's about 150 people now. So what they've done is they're not really thinking about it as in terms of IoT, they're thinking about it in terms of a retailer. What does a retailer need? So they need screens, they need Wi-Fi, they need music. How can they support that? So if you go to the next slide, there's a quote from... Do you know this book, Crossing, Crossing the Chasm by Geoffrey Moore? So he wrote it, I think it's in the 90s, and it's talking about how you sell technology to, to mass market companies. So not to early adopters, because early adopters, you can take them some early stage technology and they know what they're trying to do and that they'll make, make use of it. But if you want to sell to mass market customers, they're relatively conservative, um, they maybe don't have the skills or the inclination to do things that are cutting edge. So in that case, they need you as the supplier to do everything. So surround your disruptive core product with a whole product that solves the target, solves for the target customer's problem end to end. So it does everything for them. And that's essentially what Telefonica is doing. So having a musicologist is not an IoT business. Having somebody who does graphics for the screen is not really an IoT business. But they're not trying to be an IoT business. They're trying to be a smart retail business and they're trying to solve the problem from, from that perspective. So that's, I think, a, a really ex interesting example from, from Telefonica, what telecoms operators can do. Then the last example, if you go to the next. Okay, just to think in terms of what they're doing. Again, they're not solving every problem. Um, there's something helping awareness. They're doing a lot, I think, to get rid of the complexity and help with the business case. Still a bespoke contract. Doesn't really have a trigger, so they're not doing everything. But they are doing quite a lot to, to get rid of the other problems. I mean, I said they haven't done local, but you could argue that they are actually doing local by having the local install teams. They're doing quite, quite a lot. So that's Telefonica. Then the last one, just talk about consumer IoT briefly and what Vodafone's doing. So number of operators, telecoms operators and non-telecoms operators are playing around with what happens with in, in consumer IoT. Vodafone launched this towards the end of last year, so October, November time last year, this, this brand V by Vodafone, which is their consumer IoT brand. They've launched a bunch of different things. There's a smart home uh, security cameras and that sort of thing with, with, um, with Samsung, a bunch of tra trackers. So you can, you can track your bag, you can track your pet, you can track your child. You can track your car. Um, the SOS band is for elderly people. If they have a fall, it triggers an alert and sends back to, uh, a message back to, um, to the carer to say that something's happened. So this is what Vodafone's doing. They all work on the same app. It's 
reasonably seamless, so you could have a, the same app that tracks your bag and tracks your, tracks your child and tracks your pet and so on. So it, it's reasonably seamless. It is a bit random what they're doing, though. There's not much... If you're trying to think of, from a brand perspective, what is Vodafone trying to do by, with V by Vodafone? I don't really know. Um, but I don't think they do. I think this is more about experimenting. I don't think when it comes to the consumer space, I don't think anybody really knows what's going to be successful, what's going to work. This is just Vodafone essentially playing with it. And that's what they said. Um, so this is the ex-Vodafone CEO, Vittorio Colau. Um, he said, I think by 2020, it will be important to be in this space. He's also said that it doesn't really matter what happens in 2018, 2019. It's not a short-term thing. It's, it's where they'll be in 10 years' time. So at least by experimenting and trying to learn what, 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 what works and what doesn't work, they can evolve, evolve what they're doing. I think it needs quite a lot of work. I think probably the business model maybe doesn't make that much sense. You, you, the way it works now is you, you buy the device, so somewhere sort of 50 euros, 80 euros, depending on the device. So you buy the device, and then you have to pay a monthly fee, 4 euros, 5 euros. Now, I think, well, it, it's quite expensive. For, for, for like a pet tracker, maybe you, if you really love your pet, maybe that's fine. Um, but otherwise, if it, tying yourself to a 4 euro a month contract to, to, track your, to track your cat seems like quite a lot. Um, I think we'll probably see different models. I think they'll probably start selling it where you buy the device for, let's say, 100 euros, and that includes two years of connectivity. I think that's probably the model that they would, they'll, they'll go down. So I think we'll see some changes here. Um, it's more interesting just that they're, they're experimenting, they're playing around with this in a way that telecoms operators haven't typically done in the past. Um, and again, if you go to the next slide, Pat, just trying to get rid of some of the, the barriers, that, uh, trying to help with awareness. So if you go into Vodafone stores where this is available, um, you can see these devices. They're trying to get rid of the complexity. So you can buy a kid tracker on Amazon, and you can buy a SIM separately, and you can put it together and try and make it work. So you can do this thing separately, but obviously they're, they're, they're pulling it together. Um, there's no bespoke contract. It's just a, there's a standard contract that you get from their website. So they're trying to do something to get rid of the complexity. I think with all of these examples, they can't do everything to get rid of the complexity. None of them have, have kind of ticked off all of this list, but at least they're getting rid of some of the, the difficulty from a, whether it's an enterprise user or a consumer user, just to make it easier to, to adopt IoT. So just onto the last slide, just to summarize. So we think back to the beginning, I showed you the growth figures. So Vodafone, 12%, Intel, 19%, uh, PTC, 29%. So reasonable rates of growth. I mean, most businesses would be very happy to have anything above 10%. So reasonable rates of growth, but from a fairly low base, and it's still, we don't have the same rate, rates of growth that we, we see in, in cloud. Second point, lots of barriers to, to adoption, still very high. In short, it just needs to be easier to buy. Now, companies doing things to make it, make it easier, but still very difficult to buy. The third point, I think providing a complete solution in a way that Telefonica is doing, that's probably the answer. That's probably the best way to accelerate growth. Otherwise, you're expecting your customers to pull together lots of different things, which is still, still quite complicated. So with that, I'll close.